I sense problems. I sense nothing is going to go right. It is. It is. OK, none of this is my fault now. OK. <laughs> Right, so this was born out of when Will and Dan went to Closure Conch and they talked to Rich Hickey, and he claimed that tail call optimization was impossible in Closure because of Java calling conventions. We'll talk about it a little more later, but Dan was like, no, we can do this. There, learned things in the grad version of Dan's class. So we're just applying all these techniques to uh, a new problem. Um, so a little outline of what we're going to do, just give you a refresher on tail calls and tail call optimization, just in case any of you forgot. I'll tell you about closure. I'll tell you about the state of tail call optimization and closure, how we're going to try to fix things or have already implemented some stuff, uh, talk about the implementation of the small compiler that we've got, and we'll have some demo time at the end. So to start, what are tail calls? So of course, this is going to be fixture time. So in a a non-traditional P423 sense, we can think of the stack is growing up. And if we consider our example of factorial, in the recursive line there, we see that in order for the multiplication to finish, we have to wait on the recursive call to fact, right? So if we call fact 5, which is the only thing you can call fact with, <laughs> you call fact 5, which has to call fact 4, and it keeps going. And if we gave fact a big number, even though it would still return 120, it would <laughs> blow out the top. <laughs> right? It would do all these recursive calls to get to 120, and we would have a stack overflow. Well, and this is explained, like I said, the, the multiplication line has to wait for the, the recursive call to return. Uh, and so we'll use n plus 1 stack frames for whatever n we put in to factorial. Now let's consider a different version of factorial. This one also takes an accumulator. And if we look at the recursion line, we don't have a multiplication waiting. We've embedded it in the accumulator. So that recursive call is the very last thing that has to be done. So when it returns, we are done. So we could go back to our picture here, and I'll redraw it bigger, because I know I drew it tiny. Instead of the stack growing and growing and growing, we can think of well, fact 1 calls off to fact 4, 5, calls off to fact 3, 20. And you see this little trick that I've done? This is called tail call optimization. So we simply reuse the caller stack frame. My compiler students in the room will, will uh, note that this was the first thing that we did in the scheme compiler, actually. We didn't have non-tail calls at first. Uh, we don't need to perform stack manipulations. And we can think of this as I remember Dan telling us in 3.11. It's a go-to with arguments. So what I find interesting is that the history of this goes back to the late 70s when Scheme co-developer Guy Steele published a paper in, in ACM. He actually pitched this as a speed improvement because he used tail call optimization to do arithmetic operations that beat Fortran, which was kind of cool, even though we think of it as a, as a memory savings. So with all that, we should all be up to speed on tail call optimization. I think you all remembered it, but now you're refreshed. And we'll move on to closure. Uh, as you have probably heard, it's a dialect of Lisp. It draws on things from common Lisp. It's also got a lot of scheme-like things in it. Uh, but it primarily targets the JVM. They've also got a new version of it that targets uh, Microsoft CLR. There's a cross-compiler from closure to closure script. Uh, and one of the neat things about being embedded in these existing virtual machines is that it has complete interoperability with whatever virtual machine it's deployed on. So for the JVM version, you get complete access to Java objects and uh, Java libraries. And so whereas a lot of communities have to bootstrap themselves on building libraries, they already get all the Java libraries. It's pretty cool. But the problem is that being deployed on the JVM means that it gets some of the limitations. Specifically, the reason that you're here listening to me is that it puts restrictions on tail call optimization. Now, I've not been able to find anywhere that says specifically, this is the reason that Clojure can't have tail call optimization on the JVM. There's some hand waving about security concerns. Uh, the official Clojure documentation says Java calling conventions prohibit it. As far as I can tell, 
it, that would be fantastic. I was actually going to ask for that. Um, things I've seen, you know, involve that when you when you use tail call optimization, you are rewriting the stack frame, and so it's harder to give out a full stack trace if something goes wrong. And that's you know some people's explanation of this is the Java calling conventions, and you can't you know obfuscate the the back trace. Um, now there there has been some talk about fixing this issue. Uh, Ryan, you had a question? So if somebody does answer, right after the answer, could you, uh, could you just say whether or not, so Java semantics, the Java standard, mm -hmm. prevents, prevents the tail uh, optimization being applied to the the security model of Java? Right. So is this some, does this affect some oh. subset of tail calls, some specific subset of tail calls? No, so so, so the, the specific issue is the, it's the security semantics of Java, which requires a complete stack trace. Yeah. Which in itself is not a problem. There's actually a paper that I have to look up the rap, but I'll give it to you. Right. Was, um, was that it says here's how we a have tail calls and b respect your stupid security thing. Yeah. Um, okay. I have seen it, that. It's the combination of saying you must have a complete stack trace and you must have this column convention. The two of those together basically requires that you actually have a literal stack. Okay. And, and, okay. And like everybody who's ever done functional programming on the JVM, there's like at least 50 languages before closure showed up. Um, all of them said, hey, we're going to do this and, and screw Java. And then, like, they never got anywhere. Yeah. And, like, like, they implemented it, but they didn't have Java interop then. So, everybody's not done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, Oracle actually has, you know, Oracle, formerly Sun, well, Sun used to own Java. Anyway, uh, they, they have an issue on file of fixing this tail call optimization problem. Uh, for languages like Clojure, and it was targeted for release in Java 7, but Java 7 came out last summer, and there's still no fix. So the, I've heard rumor that it's supposed to make it into Java 8, but... This is Java's amazingly fast speed of uh, progress. Right, <laughs> right. So we have no idea when we're going to be able to actually do TCO, and this is why I'm able to keep working on this project. Uh, so the, there's actually not a complete lack of constant space tail calls in uh, Clojure. There are two forms that we have. We have recur for self-recursion and trampoline for mutual recursion, which I'll give a couple examples. Did you have a question? So does CLR have tail calls? Yes, it actually does. I actually don't know what the story is with uh, the CLR version of Clojure. OK. Um, so they've managed to work around whatever yeah, I don't, problem was? I don't know. Specifically for closure, um, the CLR people aren't as vocal as the JVM people. Okay. Like the JVM uh, the version is the big base. Right. Yeah, but like I said, I don't know if the closure, the version of closure, takes advantage of that. I know it's possible. Um, yes. So we have these two forms for limited constant space tail calls. First, we have recur, and to motivate this, we'll go back to our tail recursive version of factorial and scheme, and we can do a really simple translation of this function into the equivalent closure, like so. Now the the syntax is pretty close. Uh, the thing to notice is this recur down here, where previously we had fact tr. We now use recur. And if we don't do this, we will blow the stack. I have checked this. <laughs> um, and this, is, this isn't so bad, right? You know, you're kind of saying, well, I'm going to recur back to the top of this. But it only works for self-recursion. You can't say recur to somebody else. For that, you have to use the trampoline. So to motivate this, oh, yes. then you'll probably jump up to that lambda. You probably won't jump up to the very top of the def n. The, the recur form refers to the closest uh, labeled block, so like a, a, a named function, or they've got a loop construct that provides like a, a, a jump label. So yeah, Adam point, makes a good point. In this case, you will definitely jump up here. But if some of this code in here, for whatever reason, if somebody redefined if as a macro that expanded to you know, this is a loop, then we would have recur jump up to there. Question? So is that static or dynamic scope? It should be static scope. So recur goes up to the less static. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so 
back to trampoline. Okay, we have a very simple version of even and odd, that mutually recur type, mutually recursive loop. Well, if you type this into the closure REPL and try to do, say, my even of 100,000, oops, you stack overflowed. So what's the solution? Actually, with built-in closure tools, you can fix this. The first thing you have to do is add a manual code transformation of making sure that all of your functions return thunks. Now, this is a trick that everybody should remember from 3.11. So down here at the bottom, we've simply wrapped our call to my odd in a thunk. And I've alighted my odd, but you can, uh, you can certainly imagine what goes on in there. <laughs> So now we can feed it into the trampoline. We tell the trampoline what function we want to run, and we give it the argument, hey, we get back true. This is cool. So we see for self-recursion, we've got recur. That's pretty cool. Like I said, that's, that's almost natural to say, I want to recur back up to the, to the nearest uh, labeled point. With trampoline, we have to do manual code transformation. Oh, and there's another problem with it that I didn't mention. It's a very simple trampoline. And say you had mutually recursive functions where you wanted to return a lambda expression out of it. You can't do that. The documented solution is to change your code so that you put the lambda expression into a data structure. And when it returns, you unpack the data structure. Um, I have a question about the recur form. OK. Uh, so I know Scala has a similar option, okay. but they don't require the recur form. They can infer where they can do right. it. Right, right. So why does Closure not I don't know. I've actually wondered that myself. That would be a fairly simple little pass to write really yourself. No. I, I was about to I say, guess why not redefine Defin to be a macro that looks at the thing and says, yeah. hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like recursive call. I, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, don't <laughs> know. <laughs> just looks at the code and says, well, yeah. that's a call and tail position. Yeah. Just I have read that about Scala. I've never done any Scala, but I know that you can like pass it the optimize flag, and it'll do some automatic tail yeah, call yeah, recursion uh, for you. What code does it generate? What does it transform? Uh, it, it makes, it, if it can, it will make a tail recursive call. Well, there are no tail recursive Yeah, but what byte code do you generate? Oh, it, it does strange <laughs> things with with uh, inner classes that magic it out probably in the wild. Which is, I think, the same trick that's going well, on with the, the recur form here. Isn't the Java code is totally different? Oh, so does it insert while loops everywhere in case of recursion? And no, 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 no. Anywhere it finds where it can lift out and make it tail recursive, I imagine that's it just thing in there. Did you imagine that question? I imagine it, it'll generate a while loop there, but it doesn't do it in every case, only when it knows for sure that it's a tail recursive call. Okay. okay. We'll have to talk about Scala later. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about Scala. Um, okay, so yeah, so we have to make manual code transformations. We can only return, you know, non-function values. Well, we're compiler writers. We can we can do better than this. <laughs> so what do we do? First, we take some parentheses from 3.11. We take a little bit of P4.23 compilers, and we get out a source-to-source -source compiler, and it serves everybody. Uh, I did. I did. Uh, so what I have to show for you today is a small source-to-source -source compiler that is just a little macro that I've written in Clojure. You just call off to the macro with your code, and it rearranges it uh, such that it uh, has constant space tail calls. Um, it only handles a really small subset right now. One of the things that I really want to move forward on is making sure that it handles a bigger subset of the language. Uh, and the really cool thing is that you can hand it code that's not written in a tail recursive fashion. And because of the transformations it does, you still get uh, constant space tail calls. So what we do is very simple. First we CPS, we thunkify, and then we throw it on a trampoline. So the trick to all this beyond what you learned in 3.11 is that we want to make this performant. Because the closure people like their speed. And even though I'm working on this with Dan, we want it to be quick. <laughs> so with respect to the CPS transformation, uh, we are currently using a transformation via Donvi uh, from the paper that's just called First Order One Pass CPS Transformation. Uh, it eliminates a lot of what they call administrative redexes that other CPS transformations uh, introduce. So where you have things pulled out and evaluated that don't need to be like the, the symbol. So if you're thinking about the, the lambda calculus, because that's how these CPS algorithms are defined, you have the variable case, the lambda case, and the application. Well, you don't need to pre-evaluate symbols. 
And you don't need to pre-evaluate lambdas. So you just pull out the applications and pre-evaluate them. And that's how you go from this monster via Plotkin. So this is lambda xx applied to 5. OK, I know 5 isn't actually in the lambda calculus. Uh, but this evaluates in scheme very nicely. You get this monster with four continuations in it. If you use Donvi's algorithm instead, like we have, you get this guy. So it only introduces, whereas you have this lambda at the top that takes the uh, initial continuation, and you've got that in the plot conversion. This one introduces three new continuations, and this one only introduces one. So you, you get a vast reduction on the number of continuations you have floating around. You get a performance savings on the number of continuations that you're applying. And it's overall just good for performance. Uh, in terms of the functification that we're doing, we don't have a very smart algorithm right now. We're just saying you know, functions return a thunk that has to be invoked on the trampoline or applications. Uh, we would like to, to go further with this, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little more later. Um, and of course, the, the thing is here that function application, in any case, it's a jump, and it has a small cost. So you want to have enough thunks such that you don't use a ton of stack space between uh, bounces on the trampoline. But if you have too many thunks, then you're going to have all of those invocation costs for every single jump that you do. Um, and in terms of the trampoline that we're using, we're not using Clojure's built-in trampoline. We're rolling our own really simple function. Uh, it checks a reference, which is equivalent to a scheme box. And we just put in the box false, which indicates that the computation's not done. When we reach the empty continuation, we flip that reference to true. The trampoline detects that and throws out whatever value it's got at that point. So improvements that we would like to make or are currently making. Uh, the version of the compiler that I'll be showing you today, though you won't see any code, is a very P423 style compiler. It does pattern matching at every stage. Each pass you know, goes through the entire grammar and applies whatever transformation. Uh, a much better solution to this is to use closures, records, and protocols, which means that to add a new expression to the language, we add a new record type for that expression and then align to the parser in order to, uh, in order to parse in that expression. So records and protocols were added to Clojure for the purpose of uh, speed. So I haven't noticed any performance issues with the compiler. But being a student of Kent, I couldn't live with myself if my compiler was slow. So this, this will, for very large expressions, make it faster. And like I said, the extensibility is way better. Uh, we're also, in the last couple of days, Dan and I have been talking about ways to make the trampoline better. Uh, so like I said, we're using this reference, which means that every time you do a bounce on the trampoline, you have to look at this flag, which you know, overall could incur quite a cost. We would like to do something simpler, where we throw uh, into the, the empty continuation an exception that gets thrown when you get down to the empty continuation, and it contains the value that you're trying to output, and then you just output that. So hopefully, the cost of one exception thrown is better than checking a flag on every bounce. Uh, moving forward, like I said, I want to continue extending the language. It's very simplistic at this point. Uh, I haven't done particularly thorough benchmarking, which I would like to see more about the speed of the code that's generated here versus uh, equivalent closure, where you can actually generate code that completes. Um, I haven't done any testing with Java interoperability. I'm not actually expecting any surprises there, but it's still something to check because you know, they, the Clojure community really likes their Java interop. Um, we're pretty happy with the Don VCPS algorithm, although in the last couple of days, Dan and I have been trying to look into if there are any other algorithms that would produce more optimal code. We're not sure about that, but that's something that we're looking into. And like I said, we don't have a smart algorithm for doing thunkification. And particularly with the new version of the compiler using records, we have a much easier way of checking the expression and looking at how many thunks there are and where they are. And to hopefully come up with an algorithm that would be able to insert like the right number. You know, based on this expression size or this expression shape, we would like this many thunks or something like that. I don't really know at this point. So with that. I can show you a few demos of what we've got going. 
Um, hopefully, my Emacs buffer is working correctly. Oh, that's not my Emacs buffer. Oh, that's not cool. So yeah, that's all the uh, the explanatory material I have. <laughs>